2 Peter chapter 1, beginning in verse 3. His divine power has granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us to his own glory and excellence, by which he has granted to us his precious and very great promises, so that through them you may become partakers of the divine nature, having escaped from the corruption that is in the world because of sinful desire. Verse 5. For this very reason, make every effort to supplement your faith with virtue, and virtue with knowledge, and knowledge with self-control, and self-control with steadfastness, and steadfastness with godliness, and godliness with brotherly affection, and brotherly affection with love. For if these qualities are yours and are increasing, they keep you from being ineffective or unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. For whoever lacks these qualities is so nearsighted that he is blind, having forgotten that he is, uh, was cleansed from his former sins. Therefore, brothers, be all the more diligent to confirm your calling and election. For if you practice these qualities, you will never fall. For in this way there will be richly provided for you an entrance into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And this is God's word. Will you join me as we pray? God, we thank you for this morning that we have the opportunity this morning to recognize who you are and what you have done. You are God and you are our Savior. That while we were a lost in our sin and rebellion, you died for us. And you rose from the dead that we can have hope of new life and freedom from sin by trusting in you. So we pray, God, that as we worship you this morning in song and as we worship you in prayer and we worship you in recognizing the truth and authority of your word we pray that you would be glorified but we would also pray that you would change our hearts and we would be more like jesus we thank you for the work you're doing in the people of this church we thank you for the ministry of the clothing exchange this weekend how many folks had the opportunity to uh, get clothing they could not otherwise afford as well as uh, see fellowship and ministry occur there we're thankful also for the student ministry, we pray for safety as they drive home from a weekend at uh, seeing baseball at the A's. And just pray that was a great time of encouragement uh, and fellowship. Uh, we pray also for Westminster Presbyterian Church. Lord, we thank you for Pastor Barnabas and Pastor Chris and, and uh, all of their folks there. We pray, God, you would continue to show yourself faithful to that church, bringing many lost into salvation through the ministry of Westminster Presbyterian. God, we also thank you for the ministry of Rod Ragsdale over in the Ivory Coast. We pray that him and his wife Angelica would be encouraged, that you would provide for all of their needs, as well as God strengthening their hands uh, to the task you've given them of reaching the lost uh, in the Ivory Coast. Uh, God, we pray for Bev, and we pray for Betty, and we pray for Karen, and ask your hand of healing on these and many others who are suffering right now uh, with illnesses and injuries, and we just pray your hand would be on them. We thank you for your work. We pray for John and Lily and Isabella and Daniel and Jerry and Tiana. Lord, these folks need to know you and your forgiveness. Would you bring the grace of Christ to their hearts even this week? We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, did you find your way to 1 Peter yet? That's wrong. It's 2 Peter. So if you're in 1 Peter, you're totally in the wrong book. I'm going to say 1 Peter numerous times this morning and uh, just switch that in your head uh, to 2 Peter. We want to have right perspective uh, in our life. Of course, we want to have right perspective in a lot of different things. But we want to have right perspective, the right view of things in our life. And especially as the Bible makes clear, we want to have the right perspective about our life in God. So the question becomes sometimes is uh, knowing what it's like to live in the world, knowing what life is like, how do we have a proper perspective our li of our life? How do we have a proper perspective of our life in God? What is God's point of view? when he looks at us and our life in this world? What is God's uh, perspective in regard to our life in him? And that really is what uh, the theme of Second Peter is, but in particular in the section of Second Peter we're going to be looking at this morning, which is Second Peter 1, 1 through 15, we want to have our pers uh, God's perspective of our life in Jesus. Our life in Jesus. Look at the first... Uh, two verses of Second Peter chapter 1. I'm going to read them. I didn't read them earlier. This is what they said. 
Uh, 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 1 and 2, uh, Simeon Peter, a servant and apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who have obtained a faith of equal standing with ours by the righteousness of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Verse 2, May grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. And this is a greeting that Peter is writing to those who would receive this letter, including us. But there's a lot even in this greeting, so let's just take a moment to think about it. About our life in Jesus, in particular this. Our life in Jesus is from God. Our life in Jesus is from God. You might think of it this way. Um, in, in many spheres in our life, we have what we would refer to as seniority. Whether it's at, at work or in your home or maybe at a club that you're a part of, there's usually kind of a ranking system. So if you're at work, your seniority might be based on a number of things. Some jobs, the seniority is based on whoever's been there the longest. See, that is seniority based on who has managed to not get fired. Uh, other jobs have seniority and it's based on performance. So especially if you're in a, a sales organization, uh, the top dog is the, the one who is selling the most stuff. And seniority is based on uh, performance. Other uh, places where seniority might come into play would be like clubs, especially charitable clubs, where seniority is based on how much time you volunteer or how much money you have donated uh, to that uh, club. And so there's ways in which in these various social engagements we have seniority. And this is very normal. Anytime you're with a group of people, usually what we're trying to do is figure out where do I fit here? How do I fit in this situation? Where's where do I rank in the pecking order? And whether it's right or wrong, I'm not saying. But that's what we do, right? And the question then becomes, in our life in Jesus, where do we fit? And the answer from this brief passage is, our life in Jesus is from God. So therefore, our seniority is not based on us. It's based on Jesus. Look at what it says in the middle of verse 1. To those who have obtained a faith of equal standing with ours by the righteousness of God and our Savior Jesus Christ. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, having spent time with Jesus in person, having witnessed his death, witnessed his resurrection, Peter, the one guy who walked on water other than Jesus that we have recorded, Peter, uh, having witnessed all of these things and having lived faithfully for God for decades, now says to us and those receiving this letter, in Christ, we have a faith that is what? Equal, because our righteousness is not based on our performance. It's not based on our status. It's not based on our race, our income, our behavior. Our righteousness is based on what? Jesus. So our life in Jesus is from God. Pay close attention to what it says. We have a righteousness of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Peter is making a very clear statement here. He believes Jesus is God. This is not God and our Savior Jesus. He is saying here, this is God, our Savior Jesus Christ. God in the flesh having come to die for us. So he says, everything we have in the kingdom of God is from Jesus. His cross pays for our sin. His resurrection gives us new life. His ascension guarantees that one day we will be glorified with him. Our life in Jesus is from God. He is our source. Faith in Christ grants to us Christ himself. Think of it this way. When you disobeyed God, you became a sinner. And when did you do that? At the very beginning. It wasn't recent. As the psalmist says, In my mother's womb I was born a sinner. All have sinned. All have fallen short of the glory of God. So because of our disobedience and rebellion, we have been separated from God and our... Our account, our relationship with God is a debtor's account. We owe God for our rebellion. When we put our faith in Jesus Christ, we trust that what he did on the cross pays our debt. Not only that, he pays our debt and grants to us his righteousness. So when God moves in us to put faith in Jesus, our account isn't nearly, merely canceled a deposit is made, and the deposit is the righteousness of Jesus. In Christ, you are as righteous as Jesus. Do you feel as righteous as Jesus? No, you don't look it either. 
I, I just got to be honest with you. You and me both, we're all in the same boat. But this is a statement of fact. Because if my righteousness is based on my behavior, I'm in deep trouble. If your righteousness is based on your behavior, you're in deep trouble. The Bible is clear. We have righteousness and our seniority and our standing together in the family of God is not from ourselves. It is from God alone. That is where we gain our righteousness. Our life in Jesus is from God. So we can get off our high horse a little bit here. Some of us string a day or two together where we haven't done any of the really bad sins. And we get pretty excited. Look, I'm pretty good. No, you were pretty good before. Now get off your high horse. On the flip side, some of us can't string a day or two to, together where we don't do any of the really bad sins. Say, so what do I do? How can, I don't, I'm, I'm total failure. You are not defined by your behavior. In Christ, you are defined by his righteousness. And this is critically important. Our life in Jesus is from God. Now, there might be a moment in your history where you put faith in God. You walked an aisle. You prayed a prayer. You put your hand up. I don't know what it might have been. And that's important that we take action and we have a moment where we can remember in our life, okay, I, I am trusting Jesus now. But the fact is, even our ability to put faith in Christ comes from Christ. He is the source of our life. And faith in Christ yields Christ because of the cross. God is our Savior, and that Savior is Jesus. He grants us righteousness. Look at verse 2. May grace and peace be multiplied to you, excuse me, in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. So his blessing upon them, and this blessing he hopes is going to carry all the way through the letter of Second Peter, his blessing is, I want grace and peace to be multiplied in your midst. All right? I want grace and peace to fill you and to fill your heart. Now, I think this is interesting. If you're going to write a letter to somebody, you get one shot to write to them about how to be a good Christian. Are you going to tell them to have grace and peace? No, especially if it's a good friend. You know what they struggle with? You really need to get over this habit, okay? Grace and peace to you when you finally get over that really bad habit you have. But that's not what he's writing to us for. His hope is primarily and firstly in our relationship with Christ. It will be characterized by grace and peace. Why would it need grace? You only need grace if you're lousy at being good. He is assuming that their ongoing walk with Christ will be a struggle. His prayer is that in the fight with flesh and the sin, they will experience the grace of Christ. And so he says, I want you to have grace and peace because it's difficult in this world, in our own brokenness and in the brokenness of the world, to have those things. How do you have grace and peace? Look, be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. We have grace and peace the more we know Jesus. You say, well, my life in Christ is not characterized by grace and peace. Simple fix. The more you know Jesus, the more you will experience his grace and peace. Now, this is going to mess with your head a little bit. Many of us assume the more you know God, the more you will not have grace and peace, the more you will experience guilt and shame. Right? The more I know God and hang out with God kind of people, the more I'm going to feel bad about how lousy I am at being like how God wants me to be. So the more I know him, the more I'm going to feel guilt and the more I'm going to be, feel shame. That makes an assumption that God is a jerk. I want you to know me really well. And I guarantee you, the more you know me, the more I will irritate you. That's what we assume. We say, well, I've read the Old Testament. He seems to be popping off every time somebody does some little thing. And what the, what the author of the Bible here is telling us uh, by the Holy Spirit is this. The more you actually know what God is like, the more you will say, this guy is filled with grace and peace. He is going to tell me the truth, but he is going to tell me the truth with grace. The more we know Christ through his word, the more we experience Christ in our life, the more our life will be characterized by grace and peace in spite of the fact that our life is pretty imperfect. To know God is to know grace and peace. 
despite the fact that our lives are filled with brokenness. My, I might suggest this. If you are knowing God more and more and you are experiencing more guilt and more shame, I, th- I don't think you're knowing God. The more you learn about God, the more you're going to realize He saves dirty, rotten sinners like you and me. He loves folks who struggle and folks who fight with sin like you and me. Our life in Jesus is from God. He is our source. He is the one who gives us righteousness. He is the one who gives us grace. He is the one who gives us peace. The only way to experience grace and peace in this life is to have a relationship with God through Jesus Christ. If you have never had a relationship with God through Jesus Christ, you can only experience peace on a temporary basis. The only way to have peace is to have peace with God, and the only way to do that is to put your faith in Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. Let me ask this question before we move on to the main section of this passage. Do we matter? Do you matter? The question is, why? Because you're amazing? Or the question is, why not? Are you really that bad? Do you matter? The answer from the scripture is yes, but because of Jesus. We matter because Jesus gave us his righteousness. We matter because God left heaven to suffer for us on the cross. We matter because God decided we matter to extend to us his grace and peace. Do you need peace in your life? And the only way to have peace in your life is to know Christ. If you have trusted Christ for salvation and you don't have peace, like many of us, the answer is we need to know him better. And many of us, I know what you're doing, you're arguing with me, knock it off. You're saying, well, tell you what, if he were to give me peace, then I'll work hard to know him better. See, I see how you're working. If he would just do everything I want, then I'd be happy to know him. That's not what the Bible is telling us. The Bible is telling us, as an act of faith, I can experience peace when I know Jesus. To the degree that I know Jesus, I can experience uh, peace. What's it going to take in my life to know him more in my heart and my mind? All right, our life in Jesus is from God. Now, the, the fact is, the Bible makes clear we benefit from Jesus. We benefit from Jesus. The fact is, we get a couple of things. We get righteousness. We get forgiveness of sins. We get eternal life. These are all really good deals, okay? But even though we have benefit from Jesus, the primary purpose of our redemption and our salvation is actually for God. Even though we benefit, we are not the focal point of our salvation. The focal point of our salvation is actually for God's benefit. So let's look again at verses 3 through 11 of 2 Peter 1. I'm just going to read uh, verses 3 and 4 to get us started here. His divine power has granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness. Through the knowledge of him who called us to his own glory and excellence, by which he has granted to us his precious and very great promises, so that through them you may become partakers of the divine nature, having escaped from the corruption that is in the world because of sinful desire. So our life in Jesus is from God. Pay attention. Now we need to understand our life in Jesus is for God. If our life in Jesus, the source of our life in Christ is from God, we need to also understand the purpose of our life in Jesus is not us, it's him. Think about it this way. Football season's getting ready to start. Oh, I, I can't get an amen on that one. Come on, let's get it on. It's been too long. All right, so the NFL is starting up. Let's just pretend there's a Seattle Seahawks. That's an NFL team for some of you who don't watch. Uh, NFL team. And so this player is getting dressed, getting ready for the opening game. He's getting dressed, and they, you know, putting the same stuff under his eyes and doing whatever they do. And then he throws on his T-shirt, which he likes to wear under his pads, and he's wearing a Denver Broncos T-shirt. <laughs> his teammates go, dude, what's up with that? He goes, oh, I love the Broncos. <laughs> oh, yeah, well, okay, yeah, you root for the Broncos growing up, but now you play for the Seahawks. He goes, no, 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 I love the Broncos. I'm really, I'm really hoping they win the Super Bowl this year. <laughs> and they're like, guy, uh, bro, aren't you hoping we win the Super Bowl? Well, yeah, sure, if they don't make it. And they said, but we're playing the Broncos today. Do you want to win today? He's like, I don't know. I'm on the fence. I'm going to do my best, though, guys. I promise you I'm going to play hard when I'm in, maybe. See, that doesn't make any sense, does it? It sounds ridiculous. In fact, you're wondering, why in the world would we say this? Here's the point. Whose team are you on? 
And this is what Peter's going to drive at. Look, you've been redeemed out of the world. You've been redeemed out of devotion to the Denver Broncos. No, seriously. That's actually something our salvation brings. I'm kidding. That's terrible. You've been redeemed out of the world. Then we're walking in life with Christ. And under it all, we've got a t-shirt on that says, I love the world so much. And it doesn't make any sense. And what, what the Bible is going to try to make clear here is, yes, it is all by grace and peace we have been redeemed out of our sin, but to be redeemed out of sin in order to continue in sin makes no sense whatsoever. We have been redeemed by God out of death and, and corruption into life and righteousness for God. So our normal response, the expected response of those who receive righteousness in life from God is to be empowered by God to live life His way. The normal and expected response for those saved from sin, empowered by God, is to live them empowered by God in lifelong worship of God Himself. Look at, again, through verses 3 and 4. Look where our, our source come from. His divine power has granted to us all things that per- pertain to life and godliness. Who gives us the power to live for God in God's ways? It all comes from Him. If you manage to say no to sin this week, congratulations, God did that for you. You say, well, I feel like I was a part of it. Oh, such a small part. Like really, really small. Like I don't even think it counts. That's how small. He's saying everything we might have, all the power we might have to have life and godliness comes from Him, comes from the knowledge of Him, and He is the one who called us to glory and excellence in this life and the life to come. He gives us everything we need to live in his ways, his power and his promises. He says, uh, we are indwelt by the Holy Spirit. We have the power of God to overcome any sin we might face. And we have his promises, which says, even when we blow it, we are still in him. It is by his power and promises that we can live for him. And the goal is, because of his power And his promises is to live for him. Having been redeemed out of the world and our own selfish ways, we are redeemed to live God's ways. What is the goal of having been redeemed out of the world? To have our life characterized by God's purposes. Look at the second half of verse 4. So that through them you may become partakers of the divine nature. What he's talking about here is, a mutual participant in the work of God in your life. Saying, I am saved from my own ways to live my way, my life now, God way, God's ways. I've escaped from corruption, it says, to therefore not live a corrupted life. He gives us everything we need to live for him. And the expectation is we'll say, I want my life to be an act of worship to the Lord. What does it mean for your life to be an act of worship to you? Does that mean you have Christian radio on the, in the car? No, it's not what it means. I mean, you might. But what does it mean? It means in the day in and day out of my life, what does it look like to live my life submitted to the ways of God? That might affect how I operate in my home. When I'm home, is the world all about me? And the other people in that home need to figure out how they fit with my routine? Maybe it will alter my attitude at work. And how I treat people, how I treat customers, how I treat employees, how I talk about my boss when he's not around. I look at each of those areas of my life and say, since God is with me, how then do I live in this moment? What does it look like to be a participant in the divine nature in this particular moment? And God gives us the power to do that day in and day out. Look at verses 5, 6, and 7. You were hoping I would skip it. It's a list of eight things that he says this since we have received from God power and promises to live for him look at verse 5 for this reason make every what oh that sounds like work for this reason what reason because God has given everything we need for life and righteousness the power and the promises for this reason since he has done all the heavy lifting make every effort to add these things to it here's the list are you ready you're not going to like it. Well, you like these things when other people do them around you. Virtue. Knowledge. Self-control. Steadfastness. Godliness. Brotherly affection. And love. He says, 
what he is calling us to, since God has done all the work for us to participate in his nature in righteousness, therefore with intention, with a plan, with effort, let's seek to live lives that glorify him through virtue. What's virtue? Being moral, making decisions that are right, not cheating people, not lying, not sleeping with people you're not married to. Simple things, but complicated things. And he's saying, have a life of virtue. Pay attention. Is he calling us to a life of virtue so that we might be righteous? No. He's calling us to have a life of virtue because we have been made righteous. Having been made righteous as an act of worship to God who has done such an amazing work in making us righteous, let's live a life of virtue. Not only virtue, but knowledge. Taking the time to know God through his word with intention and effort, reading the Word of God to know God through His Word. And some of us will say, but the Bible's really hard to understand. I don't know if I'm convinced. I used to buy it. It is really, oh, I'll give you this. It's big. It's long. It's, I think, around 97,000 words. So it's long. This offends some people, though. It's shorter than the Harry Potter series. So some of you are like, I can't read the whole Bible. Oh, Really? Hmm. I can't even get through the movies. I don't know. But the books are probably better. That's what everybody says. The books are better. I don't know. I just uh, haven't read them. For this reason, make effort to know God through his word. It's hard to understand. Really, the first time I read a manual on how to fix a car, it's hard to understand. Then the tenth time I read it, wait, I, th I think I'm starting to get it. Well, of course, it's hard to understand the first time you read it. And of course, it's hard to understand if you pick it up and read three verses every six months. It takes regularity of effort to say, you know what, I'm going to read this. I'm going to pray and say, God, show me what this means. I'm going to pray with an agenda, not just to have an inspiring verse to get me through my day. Oh, please. I want to read the word because that is the place where I encounter the glory of Christ and conviction of sin. So I want to make an effort as an act of worship to know God with his word. After all, it's self-control, the ability to say no to the things I want and yes to the things I don't want. It is not the ability to say no to the things I don't want. This is not complicated. It's not self-control to go easy on the broccoli. That is not, congratulations, you, you, you held back and only had three little things of broccoli. It's self-control to go easy on the cheesecake. Allegedly, that's a thing people do. Self-control is saying, not, oh, I stumbled into sin. Self-control is saying, if left to my own devices, I will run headlong into sin, but I'm going to say no, not because I don't want to, but because I want to. That's self-control. Self-control is saying no to those things I know are wrong and saying yes to what God has called me to do. Yes to serving those in my home. Yes to serving those in my church and those in my community and those at work and saying no to the desires of the flesh and selfishness. How far are we? Are we up to self-control yet? Steadfastness. Steadfastness there. Uh, another pastor put it this way. It's always stuck with me. A stick to A hang in there when all the benefits of hanging in there have gone. This is something we've completely abandoned in today's culture. Things are only worth our time to the degree that they benefit us. I'm thankful that churches in the persecuted church do not only participate in their community of believers when it's a benefit. And we need to rearrange our thinking, especially when it comes to the community of believers. Am I a part of a community of believers because of the benefit it provides or because these are a bunch of other sinners who have also been made righteous and I am going to be steadfast with them? Steadfastness. Godliness is living God's ways for his purposes, similar to a virtue. Brotherly affection is looking with others with honor, as it says in Romans. Compete with one another in showing each other honor. Brotherly affection is intended to challenge us that we tend to only have affection for those like us, those who have similar interests, those who come from a similar background, those who come from a similar heritage. We say, oh yeah, I love that guy because he does everything the way I do. And Peter is here challenging us by the word of God to say, Brotherly affection is an extension of affection even to those who do everything different from us. 
brotherly affection, and finally, love. And love in the scriptures is rarely, if ever, a romantic notion of love. Love in the scripture is a foxhole love. You're in the foxhole, the bombs are coming in, and instead of leaving, you stay and die together. That's biblical love. True love has no man than this, that a man would lay his life down for his friends. So these are the eight things the Bible calls us to respond in, to make an effort in, to make an effort in virtue and self-control and steadfastness and godliness and brotherly affection, to uh, make an effort to work at it. Work at it not to gain God's favor, but to work at it because we have the favor of God. Okay, you're welcome. We're going to move on. Verse 8. It's going to get worse before it gets better, so hang in there. Go for steadfastness right now you want to work on. Verse 8. Here's what it says. This is a challenge, and this is going to be convicting for most of us. If these qualities are yours in, in uh, are, excuse me, if these qualities are yours and are increasing, they keep you from being ineffective or unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Whoever lacks these qualities is so nearsighted he's blind. He's forgotten that he's been cleansed from his former sins. Therefore, be diligent to confirm your calling and your election. If you practice these qualities, you will never fall. For in this way, there will be a richly provided for you an entrance into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. He is making a simple case which most of us will find bothersome. So this will irritate you. The Bible is great at that. He is simply saying these qualities are true of those in Christ. He's not saying to gain Christ, you must have these qualities. Having put our faith in Christ, these qualities are in our life in an increasing way. Does that bother you? Because one or two of those qualities, you're really bad at, right? Okay, I'll help you out in a minute, but let's let's let it sting a little. Because that's what he's trying to do. He wants it to leave a mark. He wants the the sweat to roll down our back a little. Say, wait a minute. And he's saying, no, the point here is that it's not when I get around to it. You say, no, if you jump in the water, you become, this isn't a trick question, wet. There's no way to jump in the water without getting wet. Stop, dry suits, forget it. The dry suit becomes a fundamental part of your person when you put it on, so therefore you are wet. If the dry suit is wet, nice try. (laughs) Thought I hadn't thought of it. To be in Christ is to have these qualities in increasing measure. No ifs, ands, or buts. He doesn't qualify it. I'm sorry, there's not a qualifier here. He simply says, to be in Christ is to have these qualities in an increasing measure. Now, let you off the hook a little bit. He, He says, in an increasing measure, he doesn't say how much. So some of us are really bad at self control. Some of us, I'm trying. Most of us are really, but see, What he's calling us to in Christ is to make an effort to see ourselves grow by the power of spirit in self-control. So you may be really bad at self-control and you got this other person over here who's an A plus in self-control. I can't figure this out. Some people who just do, are able to have all this restraint, right? And we can't figure out. He's not saying because we're not as good as uh, Billy Bob over here that we're not in Christ. He's saying your goal is to have it in increasing measure. Here's what's amazing about the gospel. I'm lousy at self-control, but want to see it in an increasing measure. Billy Bob over here is a superstar, self-control, wants to see it in an increasing measure. Who's more righteous? Neither, because both of us have a righteousness from Jesus. But to be in Jesus means we're going to see these things in an increasing measure. We want to make an effort to see these things increasing in us. One of the benefits of in particular, pursuing the Lord on purpose is it provides for us the peace of mind of knowing we're in the Lord. You say, well, that sounds like legalism. That sounds like work. I don't know. You rewrite the Bible. You can deal with the Lord on that. But it says it quite plainly. Be more diligent to confirm your calling. If you practice these qualities, you will never fall. He says quite plainly, those in the Lord will pursue pursue these Thankfully, clearly speaking, is not one of these things. Pursuing these things in an increasing manner is a mark of being in the Lord. Now, again, we're not setting a measuring bar. You've got to be this good at virtue. You've got to be this good at self-control. Don't do that. You, we, uh, there's a problem with that. But there's also a problem when we say, oh, you know, it's cool, bro. Do whatever you want. It's also a problem. 
Our life in Jesus is from God, and our life in Jesus is for who? God. So therefore, our life in Jesus must be characterized by priorities that are hinged on the character of God, which is these eight qualities. All right, let's move on to the last, last one. Our life in Jesus is from God. Our life in Jesus is for God. Here's the problem, though. We have a lot of stuff. We have a lot of priorities. We have a lot of irons in the fire. We got work. We got kids. We got school. We got vacation and recreation. All these things are important. All these things matter. We got a lot of stuff. We got a lot of priorities. So the question becomes then, what is it that motivates us in a mixed bag of priorities in our life to make these things a priority in our life. What is it that motivates us? And verses 12 through 15 tell us what the motivation is, and it really is uh, the, the hinge argument of the whole book of Second Peter, which is this, time. The motivating factor for us to pursue God's interest to the exclusion of our own is time. Let me read verses 12 through 15. Therefore, I intend always to remind you of these qualities, though you know them and are established in the truth that you have. Verse 13, I think it is right, as long as I am in the body, to stir you up by way of reminder, since I know that the putting off of my body will be soon, as our Lord Jesus Christ made clear to me. And I will make every effort, so that after my departure, you will be able to, at any time, recall these things. Our life in God... Our life in Jesus is from God. Our life in Jesus is for God. And finally, our life in Jesus here is short. Very brief. This is the point he's going to be making in 2 Peter. And let's, we're just something for next week to think about. Uh, some false teachers had been coming in. And it had been a whole like 30 years since Jesus' death. And they were coming into the churches. And they were saying, listen, Jesus said he was coming back. Yeah, I think he missed the bus. He's not coming back. So really, our, our job here is to kind of do the best we can, mostly live for ourselves. And Peter's argument is going to be, throughout the book of Second Peter, he's coming back, and on that day, you're going to want to make sure your life lines up with what he is hoping to see. And so in this particular passage, he's referring to his own life as being short, but we need to be aware he's going to be referring to all of our lives as being short, and fundamentally, understanding that one day we will all stand before the Lord, and that, time, and that day is really soon. Really soon. Our life in Jesus here is short. His body is soon going to be... And after Second Peter was written, he probably was martyred. He was beheaded by uh, Nero, uh, emperor of Rome, probably three or four years after Second Peter uh, was written. And with that in mind, a lot of us do this, especially as we get older. And I'm not saying any of you are older than 30. I don't see anybody out here that looks older than 30. Amen. Right, see? But as we get older, it seems especially, we put a little bit more priority on getting things in order, getting things lined out. Maybe we're going to write a will. Uh, maybe we're going to put together a trust for some of our possessions. Maybe we'll sit down with our children and have conversations about what we intend after that day comes because we never know when that day will be. And, and sort of there is a sense of this. Before that day comes, it seems a little bit morbid, but it also makes sense. Let's make sure things are lined out. And Peter here is doing that. But his purpose is is to make sure the ministry of the gospel in him keeps going even after he dies. He says, my time here is short, and I want to make sure that after I leave, the legacy I leave is the gospel in the hearts of the people I have served. Here is his argument. Time is of the essence. There is not enough time for us to be wasting it on things that don't matter. There is too little time to waste There is too little time to spend it in worry and anxiety. Verse 12, look what he says. Therefore, I intend. He's making a volitional decision, a decision of his will. I know what God is like. I know what God has done. Based on that, here is what I am going to do with my life. There is no time left, he is saying. Time is out. I don't know when tomorrow will be my last tomorrow. (coughs) Excuse me. And so I'm going to use my life to stir up in others. 
the life of Christ, to live their life in Jesus and to live their life for Jesus. That's the legacy he wants to live. Look at what he says in verse 15. I will make what? Every effort. Meaning, certainly he is going to make an effort to pray, but he is going to, with intention, in the relationships he has with others, challenge them to say, Jesus is coming tomorrow. Are you dialed in? Jesus is coming tomorrow. What does your life look, look, your life look like? Is it for God or is it for yourself? There is no time, Peter will remind his leader, readers, <coughs> excuse me, for lesser things. He says, I am putting off my body. My death is coming soon. And eternal life is around the corner. There is no time for lesser things. There is no time on the minuscule. And when he looks at lesser, lesser things and greater things, he says the higher priority is the purposes of God, seeing these qualities of righteousness worked out in the people of God and in his own heart. Look at the second part of verse 13. He says this, I think it right, to stir you up by way of reminder. He understands that living a life for Jesus in steadfastness and self-control and virtue requires reminding. Anybody else grow a little while and then sort of peter out a little bit? Peter out. See what I did there? I wasn't on purpose. <clears throat> yeah, that'd be great. What is it? Coors Light? Yeah, but yes. Okay, yeah. That's terrible. Thank you, Ben. It was water when he left. I didn't. It's terrible. Thank you. So he is saying, I know that you need reminding. That as it says elsewhere in the scripture, spur one another on toward love and good deeds. So, so we decide, so we, we come together and say, you know, God's been working in my heart and I really need to start saying no to these habits that I know are wrong. And you get together and you pray and you know one of the best ways to really see victory over that over time is to make sure that you have a good friend who every couple of weeks is going to call you up and say, hey, just a quick reminder, remember we got together and, and God really moved in your life. You know, how is that going? And if it's a really good friend, hopefully you can say this, oh, it is awful. I'd fall off the wagon, but the wagon is, I don't even know where it's at. It's gone. And then in grace, that friend will say, hey, let's get back on. Let's, let's remind one another again of the grace of Christ and get after it some more. Let's experience grace together to remember that we need reminding. This is a, a growing thing, not a perfection thing. First part of verse 13, I think it right, as long as I am in the body to stir you up by way of reminder. He is saying, this life is the only opportunity we will have to serve God in this way. Once we are raised and are in heaven, you never get the opportunity to, to serve God by reminding us to do love and good deeds because it's done. Does that make sense? This is the one opportunity you have to make this investment in others for the glory of God. Once we're raised, this opportunity is gone. We're going to spend the rest of our time worshiping God and having a great time, but there will no longer be an opportunity to remind one another to live for God in this place because this place will be gone. So he's saying, I don't want you to miss this opportunity in the body to serve God by faith, to stir one another up to love and good deeds, to be prepared to put off the body in any particular moment. All right. Our life in Jesus is from God. He is the source. He is the one who has provided it. But our life in Jesus is for God. It's not for us to do with whatever we want. He has given us his life that we might live for him. And finally, our life in Jesus is really, really short. Okay, just three or four quick things, and then we're going to have a, a, a song to, to respond to the Lord in. Would you characterize your life as a life of anxiety or a life of peace? That's not a fair question. We know, we look at the, the research, Americans today are living completely frazzled, anxious lives. I mean, it's, it's extraordinary. But here's, here's the understanding very quickly. I'm not gonna, you're gonna walk out of here skipping. Well, you can if you want. But if you trip, that's, that's your thing. Our life, directed by us for our things, will always lead to worry. 
100% of the time, every time it's tried, never fails. Even if you get everything you ever wanted, your life for your ways will lead to worry. Ask some people who've really hit it out of the park. You, you know some of them. Hey, once you hit it out of the park and you did it, all the worry went right. right. No, because now I was filled with worry, I would lose it. And then I realized I peaked too soon. I still got 40 years to live. Now what am I going to do? Our life from us leads to worry. God's life for him and from him leads to peace. But it means our, characterized, our life is characterized by his things, not by our things. It means we have to finally let go of trying to find peace our own way and say, okay, I can find peace by knowing Jesus better and pursuing a life of virtue and steadfastness and self-control. That doesn't sound awesome. That sounds boring. Okay, then keep doing it how you're doing it. See how that works. You'll get to a certain point and you'll say, all right, this isn't working. I'm going to try peace out. And it's through Jesus for him. Our only lasting peace is from Jesus through repentance and faith. The only way to have peace with God is to repent that we are sinners and receive his salvation through faith into a life of joyful obedience. And these things all work together. I receive forgiveness. I receive righteousness. I receive the opportunity for joyful obedience. What people are looking for nowadays, I'm seeing more and more. I want Jesus. I want forgiveness so I can do whatever I want. That doesn't make any sense. I got saved from drowning so I could spend my life underwater. No, we got saved out of the corruption of our own flesh that we might live a life of joyful obedience. Many of us are playing a little bit too friendly with the desires of our flesh. You've come up with all kinds of reasons why it's not that bad. Are you going to live your life for you or are you going to live your life for God? Who gave you your life and who is it for? It's for the Lord. God is God. We are made for him and our life is for him. So I'm going to say a bad word. See, you're awake. Look at that. Wow. We must make every effort to know him. We must make every effort to know him. For those of you who are married, just a quick thing just to drive you nuts. Here you go. You ready? How satisfied would your spouse be with your relationship with them if you spend as much time with your spouse as you do with the Lord? That's not right. That's not fair. Okay, so well, I don't want to have quiet times that last 30 hours. Okay, how about this? How about you, instead of saying, I'm going to meet God for 20 minutes in the morning, say, you know what? God's hanging with me. God's just with me. How about your day is your quiet time? How about your day is just viewed as I'm with the Lord today? That's how he's viewing the day. How about that we just say, you know, I'm with the Lord. What does my day look like knowing God is with me? God is God. We are made for him. Our life is for him. We ought to make every effort to know him because he has been so gracious to give us life and righteousness. Last thing, and we'll close with this. You're welcome. To live as though we have lots of time is the definition of arrogance. To live as though there's lots of time is the definition of arrogance. First of all, for those of us who are young, there's plenty of young people we know who the day just that was their last day. It's the, it's the definition of arrogance for me to say, I got plenty of time to figure this out. You don't. Secondly, even if you you put in a 90-year, 120-year cycle. Ask some of the folks in the room, I'm not saying they're here, who are near that stage. You'll be gracious with them, right, folks? Say, is it really as long as it seems? Is it? No, it's over like that. It's gone. All of a sudden, 80 years are gone. So to live as though we have life, uh, lots of time is the definition of arrogance. Humility in the Lord says, time is short. How will I take advantage of the next afternoon? What does Sunday afternoon look like if it's not about me and it's about knowing my Savior? And now we're meddling. That wasn't right. What does my morning look like with my family if my morning is not about me, but it's about my Savior? What does work look like if work is not about success and significance for me, it is about my Savior? And we don't have time to do anything other than that. To the degree we, that we don't, which is often, we thank God 
for his grace. Our life in Jesus is from God, it's for God, and it's very, very short.